whilst the slides are lo loading, perhaps I can, I can make a start. I'm just to thank Valerie for a very comprehensive analysis, which neatly leads me on to my topic, which is um, Bosnian constitutional reform, an elusive endeavor to end a frozen conflict. Um, it's, a, it's a topic which I can't really do justice to in, in 20 minutes. Um, the presentation and the slides which I'll share were really designed for an hour, hour and a half lecture. Um, perhaps what I can do is, is provide a, an overview of six, six main issues. Um, the first is the idea of a constitution as a foundational text and really seeing a constitution less as a, as, a, as a document, but more as an organizing principle or even the soul of a state. Um, second, I'll look at the legal constitutional provisions in Bosnia and how they can be amended. Third, why have reforms failed to date? Um, Valerie uh, has very astutely set out uh, the basis for the constitution, why it was created. And as she noted, it was seen as an interim constitution. And therefore, the question of reform is fundamental. Fourth, what do people in Bosnia think about democracy? What do they think about ethno-nationalism? What do they think about tolerance and accommodation? And why do elites, if the Bosnian people have a different perspective, do they operate in the current system as they do? Five, I will look at what Bosnia can learn from other states that have more evolved constitutional rules like Britain. Um, and then finally, I'll uh, raise a question more than anything about what radical reform might look like and how it might be practically achieved. Um, if we move on to the, the first slide, um, constitutions have a long history. In fact, the history goes back to the dawn of man. Wherever you have a grouping of um, people who, are, who do not share a familiar relationship, then you will inevitably have written or unwritten, codified or uncodified rules about how they interact with one another, how they share resources, how they, uh, how they ensure that they are collectively secure. Um, now, constitutions, um, in terms of them being a written document, again, go back thousands of years, perhaps in, in the Western sense, when we talk about constitution, we really go back to the Greeks, in particular the thoughts of Aristotle. And Aristotle thought that the formal cause of a city-state was its constitution. Um, he defined constitution as a certain ordering of the inhabitants of the city-state, and he sp spoke of a constitution as a community uh, as a, as a community and as the form of the compound and argued that where, whether the community is the same over time depends on really whether it has the same constitution. The most interesting thing that Aristotle, for me, said about constitutions is that he said that the constitution is not a written document, but an imminent organizing principle analogous to the soul of an organism. Now, if you think about the constitution as a soul, you inevitably start to ask the question, well, can somebody give you a soul? Can, you, can it be externally generated? And of course, the answer to that is no. And that's really the, the focus of my, um, my talk today. Um, th there's obviously different ways of conceiving of constitutions, whether as foundational laws or social contracts. If they're social contracts, that of course means that you've had some interaction in trying to set out what the terms of that contract is. Constitutions in most instances and the way they're perceived in almost every society as, are as being inflexible, difficult to change documents. The modern reasons for that is to, is to limit, limit mob rule. Second is to protect the rights of minorities and individuals. Um, third, it's really to set the rules which will determine all other rules henceforth. And the contemporary focus on constitutions is looking at institutions and how institutions interact with, with the population at large. The reason being is that the way an environment is created will determine the way the people in that environment behave. So people behave, for instance, very differently in a war setting than in peacetime. And therefore, if institutions have an autonomous impact on people's behavior, then they can, of course, mitigate conflict and regulate conflict. 
we move on to the next slide, please. Constitutions, when it comes to divided societies, are seen in a slightly different light. Now, d divided societies obviously come about, they, they don't just exist. And wherever you have heterogeneous populations which are not homogenous, then of course you need to then assess, well, how do people interact if for whatever reason, war, conflict, ideology, people have specific divides and you need to consider what are the means and mechanisms with which to regulate any potential conflicts. The predominant form of constitutional model that has been deployed in post-conflict settings has been a kind of consort, what's called a consociational model. That has an, a number of different characteristics, um, but essentially the premise of a consociational model is that the people are divided and therefore power ought to be given to the elites because elites, if they're educated, mobile, be belong largely to a particular class of people, will cooperate with one another despite the lack of political consensus among the population at large. Um, so essentially, th these are some of the, the criteria that elect elites cooperate and accommodate other despite people being divided. The idea is for minimum civic involvement because people can't be trusted. Um, power, sharing, power sharing and autonomy is built into the system, which means that you want consensus politics rather than politics of majority rule. And the idea for elites cooperating is, 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 is basically the, it's, it's premised on a number of different factors. One is because um, international actors can put pressure on elites quite easily. Um, elites are meant to have a long-term concern for the political system. And also they have a self-interest in order to ensure that the system works so that it works for them more than anything. Um, of course, when Consortia, consociational model are successful, what you would like to see is institutional trust. You want to see trust among elites. We, you want to see peace and stability, and you also want to see accommodation and progress on policy issues. If we move on to the next slide, you'll immediately know that, that consociationalism is a kind of utopia. There are many abstract problems with, constitution, with consociationalism. Uh, and Bosnia, as, as um, Valerie has highlighted, has set out what are all the problems with a consociation model if it's not properly deployed. Um, firstly, the constitutional prescriptions can be very shallow. So for instance, if you say you need four, three people in a presidency, three people getting agreement is gonna be far more difficult than one person. And you can amplify that the, the more number of people you add to um, shallow constitutional prescriptions for power sharing, the more difficult power sharing becomes. Rules may not be properly incentivizing actors. So a classic example might be Libya. If you have very powerful generals who have their own means of income, for instance, from oil, if they have institutional support or ideological support that emanates from external powers and external interests, then they can upset the entire system. So so rules are meaningless unless people are willing to adhere to them. And of course, the assumptions can be very, very problematic. And one of the biggest assumptions in Bosnia was this idea that Valerie raised of ancient ethnic hatreds, which I'll come to again, because if people don't display ancient ethnic hatreds, then of course, the idea for elite sharing power um, has no basis whatsoever. And, and it really challenges the idea of why this particular model was deployed. So the assumptions are a critical aspect to successful consociationalism. If we move to the next slide, um, Bosnia is obviously the case study that I'd like to, to highlight. And if you move to the next slide, um, the next slide will basically uh, cover um, what really has, Valerie has already um, outlined in quite detail, that Dayton, um, basically provided the constitutional structure for Bosnia. It was Annex 4, which says pretty much everything I need to say about the priority accorded to it. Um, the constitution helped successfully end the war as part of the peace agreement. However, as Valerie has indicated, this was an interim measure. And the fact that it hasn't developed in 25 years says a lot about the problems that were created in the incentive structure when the constitution was drafted. If we move to the next slide, um, we've seen um, a, 
a few days ago when, when Nana shared information about the demographics that Bosnia was a very inter-ethnically mixed society. Um, villages were highly inter intermixed. Sarajevo, just prior to the war, um, had the highest rate of inter-ethnic marriage of anywhere in Europe. Um, and if you look at the map, you just need to see that the population was, was, was mixed in a very uh, deep sense. And that was a product of centuries of coexistence and compromise and building up a tradition that was uniquely Bosnian, which comprised of three major ethnic groups, uh, the Bosnian Muslims, the Bosnian Croats and Bosnian Serbs, but also significant minorities, Jews, Roma and others, who make up about 12% of the population, at least if you just go by um, self-declared markers of identity. If we move then to the next, next slide, what that then says is you had a very plural and multi-ethnic society. Um, so what were, what were the um, provisions of the constitution um, that were relevant when they were drafted? to this milieu in which the constitution was imposed. Well, as I said, principles of autonomy and power sharing were worked into the constitution. What does that mean in practice? It means a decentralized federalism. Um, essentially, you have two entities which have their own constitution. Within the federation, you have 10 cantons, um, two of which are predominantly Bosnian Croat, and eight of which are predominantly Bosnian Muslim. And then you had the Republika Srpska uh, entity where you don't have a cantonal system. You have a very streamlined municipality system, which uh, in reality was a product of a successful ethnic cleans cleansing campaign during the war. You have very few minorities, which means that the functioning of the entity constitution in, in Republika Srpska is much more successful than in the Federation, which raises the question of what you can achieve by successfully ethnically cleansing territory during the war. Um, perhaps the closest analogy to the Republic of Serbska constitution is the German constitution. The German constitution was an imposed constitution. Um, Germany, of course, carried out mass atrocity crimes during World War II, which meant they went from a heterogeneous population to a homogeneous population. And in fact, the German constitution was amended many, many times very successfully, and it was seen as a successful outcome. But of course, people, real, people forget to realize that um, the reason it's successful is there was a completely homogenous society post-war. And that therefore raises the question of legitimacy in, in respect to constitutions that emanate after post-conflict crimes. Um, another feature of the constitution is that it's proportional representation um, both in the executive, the legislature, and judiciary. There must be parity in representation of the three ethnic groups, the Bosnian Muslims, Bosnian Croats, and Bosnian Serbs. Decision-making is by, by a grand coalition, consensus rather than majority rule. And crucially, the constitution builds in minority vetoes. That means if a president, presidency, for instance, the presidency is made up of three individuals, one Bosnian Muslim, one Bosnian Croat, one Bosnian Serb. If it's an important constitutional issue, the constitution prescribes that uh, the decision should be by consensus. If it isn't by consensus, um, uh, then in theory, the majority can go ahead and make the decision. However, um, each ethnic group retains a veto, a, a vital national interest veto. Now, you might say, well, what does important mean? And what does a vital national interest veto entail? They are, of course, undefined in the constitution, which means they mean whatever the particular ethnic group wishes it to mean, which means they veto anything that is not in their immediate self-interest. If we move on to the next slide, why is, is the Bosnian state constitution a success? Well, stability, as, as Valerie mentioned, was the operative aim. You haven't had a violent conflict, so you might say it's a success. And indeed, many international actors will say, yes, it's a success. In fact, they've deployed the model elsewhere since, and I'll come to that slide in a second. However, it is not a success by any measure. Essentially, it's, it stopped a violent conflict 
and transferred a violent conflict to a political conflict in the constitutional institutions created by Dayton. Um, there is a focus on collective equality of ethnic groups rather than an individual. So for instance, if you do not identify as Bosnian Muslim, Bosnian Croat and Bosnian Serb, you cannot be a president of Bosnia because you do not have any rights if you are not an ethnic member of that group. You have to be belong to one of the three constituent peoples in order to be a president. That means 12% of the population cannot be the president of the country. Um, cooperation accommodation is very difficult. The reason is that the electoral system, the cantonal systems, the need for parity in every institutional structure means that um, elites have an interest for having maximalist and nationalist led policies because as soon as they don't, they will be challenged and to say that they are selling out their own ethnic group. And in a game theory language, there is a prisoner's dilemma or a prisoner's deadlock in the sense that every, every decision is seen as beggaring thy neighbor, that if you don't make a maximalist decision in favor of your, ent in your ethnic group, then you will be undermined and you lose legitimacy in the face of your um, more nationalist base, which the electoral system will inevitably mean has the most uh, impact because of the proportional representation system. Um, and finally, um, the Bosnian constitution has no civic mandate and neither is a future civic involvement envisaged because as we know, the predominant uh, stereotype is that the population itself is divided. Um, Valerie's noted that there have been six major constitutional reforms, proposals, and none of those have, have been successful. So if we move to the next slide, you might ask, well, why has reform been inhibited? Uh, it's been inhibited for a number of reasons, um, partly because um, each of the three elites of the ethnic groups have competing visions for Bosnia. Um, the Bosniak elites, um, at least those, the ones that are nationalists, want a unitary civil state because they believe that will be make decisions easier, that it will reflect uh, individual human rights perspectives rather than collective equality of ethnic groups. Their detractors will say, well, this is just a power grab because Bosniaks have a majority in the state as a whole, and therefore they will seize power and then therefore disempower the Bosnian Croats and the Bosnian Serbs. The Serb nationalist elites advocate for a completely separate state. They say this state isn't working for us. Republic Srpska is majority Serb, and therefore we would like a majority Serb state, and then the rest of the state can carve up into little niches and they can deal with their own issues. Now, of course, um, the detractors say, well, that will pr principally reward the ethnic cleansing carried out during the war, and that was the basis for the peace agreement. Um, and also, what about the minorities that remain in Republic Srpska? How, who and who and what institutional structure will protect them and their human rights. And then finally, the Croat elites, the nationalist ones say, well, we don't have a specific carved entity ourselves and we would like our own. And the detractors of that will say, well, that will make decision making even harder because you move from two veto points to three veto points with a substantial veto point created for the Croat nationalists. And essentially the state will become completely unworkable. So as, as I've said, there is essentially a low latent conflict between the political elites of the constituent peoples. If we move on to the, the next slide. Um, the, the, the biggest issue here is, is, of course, the veto mechanisms that have been built into the constitutional structure. Elite choice is highly restricted. There is no civic involvement built into the constitution and the biggest aspect of the constitutional structure that creates a perverse incentive structure is if you cannot pass policy if you cannot make decisions on behalf of your population at large there is no consequences so in traditional parliamentary systems if the executive is unable to pass legislation you would have immediately have a vote of no confidence and you'll have new elections the structure of the constitutional arrangements set up in Bosnia, in fact, 
reward intransigence. So if you cannot pass policy, there are no consequences whatsoever. The federal arrangements have been um, set out in the constitution itself. Um, so the federal state has a number of limited com competencies, but actually major decisions, for instance, on education and health and social services actually are decentralized to the entities. And therefore, if you can serve the interests of your immediate population, popular base by providing money, by trying to provide jobs by patronage, then actually you can bypass the state structures. And in fact, Republic of Serbska has done this extremely well. And therefore, if the state isn't functioning, it's no problem because all the elites get paid anyway by the state. 80% of party funding comes from the federal state and all salaries are paid by the state. And salaries, Valerie might be able to tell me, but they are some of the highest paid salaries in Europe of politicians anywhere. Um, and therefore, you know, the elites in the constitutional structure have an interest to keep things going as they are. Um, the only measure of success within Bosnia has been the fact that there is a mechanism for the international community to intervene and bypass the act, all the institutions of Bosnia through the office of the high representative. And as Valerie noted, this was very common um, um, when Paddy Ashdown and others were in, in power in the early 90s um, and they could bypass the spoilers of the constitutional structure. However, that is seen as something that can't be done anymore because the idea is that the locals have to sort out these problems themselves, notwithstanding the fact that the locals have to deal with an imposed internationally agreed constitutional structure that they had very little way of amending uh, when it was negotiated in Dayton. If I move to the next slide, um, and the slide after that, that's too complicated to explain in 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> the next slide after that. Um, so even though Bosnia, the Bosnian state constitution can be seen as a failure, it is actually seen as a success. The Bosnian model has been applied in East Timor, it's been applied in deployed or aspects of it have been deployed in Iraq, aspects of it have been deployed in Afghanistan, um, because the idea is, is it stops conflicts. Whatever happens after that is not the concern of um, people who rush into developing these constitutions. The second aspect is that there have been extensive political, the extensive political compromises often create these short-term accords. So the same sorts of power sharing mechanisms were set up, an autonomy mechanism was set up in Iraq. However, as I said, the risk of consociation models is they do not reflect the realities on the ground, and therefore they are, they are, they are therefore very likely to fail as they have in Iraq, as they have in Afghanistan, and as they have in East Timor. I'll move on to the next slide, given that I'm running out of time. Um, if we were to re-envisage the Bosnian constitutional model, how would we do it? And should the Bosnian model be revised? Um, so the major premise, as I set out at the start of my lecture for the Bosnian model, was that there were ancient ethnic hatreds. Um, something that I've done is I've looked into that question by doing statistical analysis of what the preferences are of the elites in the constitutional structure and what the preferences are of the population at large. Is it true that the Bosnian people have these ancient ethnic hatreds? And the way you challenge or the way you assess that is to look at time series data, not just during the war or data that emanates about people's preferences just after the war, but actually look at time series data for the last 30 years. And in fact, what you see is if you look at the data pre-war, during the war and post-war, that actually the vast majority of people are far more tolerant, far more accommodating, far less likely to have um, intolerant views about people of other religion or ethnicity than the elites that represent them in, in the institutional structure. If you look at the statistics, the Bosnian population, generally speaking, even after a devastating conflict, is far more accommodating and tolerant than its neighboring population in Croatia, which then says that there is a discrepancy between elite preferences, which tend to be far more nationalistic, 
than the mass preferences for the people they represent. And the reason for that is the institutional and constitutional structure rewards conflict. It rewards intransigent, it rewards non-cooperation non non because of the nature in which power sharing and autonomy and consensus decision-making has been set up. So if you, are meant, if you are going to revise the constitution, you will not revise the constitution by asking the same people in these elite structures to change a model which benefits them and incentivize them and then shows their re-election. So how would we go about challenging that? And essentially this is where game theory and behavioral economics become relevant. The idea is that you can model in the same way you can model popular preferences, you can model elite decision-making in the institutions. And as I said, the, the problem here is you have a prisoner's dilemma or beggar thy neighbor problem. So one thing that I have uh, come up with, um, having done a lot of research and assessing these preferences, is how do you achieve um, the same sort of evolutionary process that you would see in countries like Britain, which had a constitution develop over many centuries, how do you replicate that in a very short space of time in order to ensure that you get the accommodation and compromise that you would see over hundreds of years truncated in, say, a couple of decades? And the way you do that is you essentially look at the modeling that game theory allows and see how can elites interact with one another? How do you introduce far more accommodating uh, population into the political structure from which they were um, cut out? And how do you ensure that a decision made today is not seen as a winner-take-all decision and that in, essentially you, you create repeated interaction between elites and the population at large? That means that essentially the incentive structure is modified and that cooperation and tolerance and accommodation is rewarded rather than intransigence. If we move to the, the next slide, um, I'll probably skip this slide and the next slide after that as well. Um, the model which I, I, I have proposed is essentially what's called a revolving constitution. And what it would do is it would subject um, particular parts of the constitution to greater civic deliberation. And the way you would do that is having um, civic initiatives. So this is where citizens propose what aspects of the constitution they would like to modify and alter. Um, and you have then referenda, which are very carefully calibrated to allow the population at large to have a say on their constitution. And you would repeat this on a cycle basis, maybe 10 to 15 years. The reason for that is, as I've said, the evidence indicate, the statistics indicate that people's preferences are far more accommodating than the elites representing them, but they have no say currently, other than one-off elections of their elites in the constitutional structure itself. So allowing referendums, for instance, in the three entities simultaneously, having super high majorities, allowing a debate over the, and discussion over the, the problematic aspects of the constitution will introduce a flexibility into the arrangement that is currently completely lacking. And if you ensure that constitution, the referenda criteria are quite strict and the question setting is also fair and neutral, you ensure essentially that um, you are not going to have a breakdown in the current setup because um, it will still be quite difficult to amend the constitution, but the process of debate and discussion, civil society becoming involved in the process of the future constitution will start to create a debate and discussion that's, that starts to impact outcomes. Um, I've set up a, a set of steps of how you can achieve this. The first is a constitutional covenant, widely agreed and adopted. Second is an opportunity to amend the constitution, which coincides with um, federal elections. Um, third, simultaneous entity referendums, which means that one entity or one particular uh, national ethnic group cannot hijack the process and say, well, we're gonna have a referendum for secession. 
um, because uh, essentially what you would need is simultaneous referenda in both entities and consensus in both entities, or at least a supermajority of let's say 75% in both entities, so that you're not essentially having this classic winner takes all dynamic. Instead, you are having a discussion between entities. Um, a constitutional convention should be especially convened to set out the terms of this revolving constitution and the basis for it. Um, joint entity civic initiatives could be a feature of this revolving constitution. Again, what that would mean is that if you want a civic initiative to, let's say, have um, referenda on particular issues, or you want to renegotiate re the competencies of the federal government to include, for instance, defense, um, you can't just have a civic initiative amongst your own ethnic group in Republic of Serbska, but you need to reach out to your um, civil society and NGOs and people in the cantons, in, Cro in the Croat cantons, in the Bosniak cantons, in order for those civic initiatives to go ahead. And um, a failure by the convention to draft an agreed constitution could lead to a crisis, for instance, and have a fall in the government, which would again create costs of non-accommodating intransigent behavior, whereas currently there are no costs whatsoever. And if we move to the Arif, final... Point. I'm very sorry, but we will have to finish. And yes. many things you want to say, you could probably use for, for discussion time. Otherwise, we will be seriously running out of time. Yes, this is my last slide anyway. Okay, um, good. So, so essentially, my, my conclusion here is that currently the status quo is not working. And we have to think about means and methods of introducing a flexibility into the constitutional system that hasn't previously been envisaged and incentivize both the elites and the population at large to become more involved in the question of constitutional reform. What my underlying premise is proper, that properly institutionalized and with procedural safeguards, people will be no worse off than the current constitutional structure. The outcomes would accord with the median voter, which as I have said, is far more accommodating than the elites and elites will be more incentivized to consider what their people actually think. Um, there are many uh, inspirations from which I've brought, drawn this concept and idea, um, in particular South Africa and in particular civic initiatives in Iceland. And what, constitution, what a revolving constitution would do is it would tend towards constitutional evolution rather than a revolution and create specific safeguards to stop spoilers, um, jeopardizing the current uh, stability in Bosnia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arif. Yeah, I have one question. I didn't write it in the chat, but uh, okay, thank you, Jessica. It's, it's to both of you, because I think you, you both agreed from what I heard that, uh, that we kind of need to reform the system. And my question is because Bosnia today is one of the most centralized states in the region and it's one of the most pluralist parliaments with a lot of different parties and which has had different coalition changes since 1996. So my question is, should we, should we maybe rather focus on improving minority issues, rule of law, fighting corruption, instead of changing the whole uh, governmental structure and the constitution itself because after all it did bring peace and Bosnia did improve on many levels although there are still problems remaining and could we maybe look for inspiration to the um, Helvetic Confederation to the uh, constitution of Switzerland which is also based on cantons and very decentralized and uh, needs a lot of deliberation and a lot of um, coalitions to, to come to an agreement. So could we maybe say that Bosnia is a different federation and it's not centralized, but maybe this is also an advantage and we should focus on specific issues that are still a problem. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a go at that. Um, in terms of the Swiss model, I'll say it's an emphatic no. And in, this is one of the problems is that the Swiss as well as the European Union really wants to pretend that this is a normal situation. Um, there's a good academic article looking at this issue where they note that Switzerland is an, is an example of coming together federalism, 
whereas Yugoslavia was an example of like falling apart federalism. And so the fact that the Swiss have incrementally gotten more centralized over a century demonstrates that there is sort of a will to do this. And, and that just simply hasn't been demonstrated over 25 years here. I, I would also just mention that imagine a situation with the Swiss where you had the German speaking cantons formed into an entity where they could vote as a block to basically prevent the French speaking cantons from doing what they wanted to do. It would completely disrupt the way the Switzerland works. And yet that's the situation we've got here right now. Um, unfortunately, I, I can understand the uh, lack of interest among international actors in the EU in terms of looking at the constitution because, because it is difficult um, and it is easier to want to look at some of the uh, human rights issues, uh, minority rights issues, corruption issues. But one thing we've seen over 25 years is it is actually impossible to address all of those other issues in a broken system. And this is why we don't have an independent justice system or the rule of law or effective minority rights. Um, to be honest, I'm even glad you mentioned minority rights because nobody is talking to them. We haven't about, about them. The only thing people are ever talking about now are the three constituent peoples who in fact control every <laughs> element of this system. Um, I would also just note that Bosnia is not a centralized country in any way. There's basically no central government that really has any uh, real capacities to do much right now. Um, the Republika Srpska has, especially over the past five or six years, become an extremely centralized vertical of power where almost all resources and decision making is being done in Banja Luka. Whereas the Federation is becoming increasingly fragmented as a, uh, Especially HDZ and the churches um, are seeking to create more and more of a Croat entity, de facto, if not de jure. I, I would probably completely <laughs> endorse what Valerie has just said. Um, I, I would add one thing is that a pathway, if you want to talk about game theory language, a pathway from uh, constitutional deadlock and crises, et cetera, is uh, over time um, <laughs> reform and over time interpreting the constitution as a living instrument, having progressive evolutionary development. Um, as Valerie has said, that is possible in Switzerland because you have culture, political culture, for whatever reasons have developed over time, which allow that to happen. And also institutions which coincide with political culture which allows that to happen. The second pathway from crisis and deadlock is collapse. And that is the most likely pathway that Bosnia will go down, which is collapse either in five years or 10 years or 15 years, but almost inevitably collapse and possibly into violent conflict. And that is because the institutions and constitutions bear no resemblance, have no legitimacy, there are there are, there are really no aspects of consociationalism that work. As a very simple example, the Bosnian constitution is still in its definitive form in English. That was because the three elites from the ethnic groups cannot agree on a translation of the constitution itself. In fact, technically the definitive constitution is with the spelling mistakes that rolled off from the printer in Dayton. And that constitution was amended by the high representative unilaterally by replacing the typos in the constitution with a version he felt um, was more professional. But in, te in technical terms, that constitution is not legitimate. The one with the spelling mistakes that rolled off the printer overnight, that is still the definitive one. And that says everything. I mean, if you can't agree on the constitutional text, what are you gonna agree on in the future? Just a uh, just second for the uh, timekeeping issues. We, uh, Hamid, we have not forgotten you. And uh, I will suggest that Hamid starts uh, at 12 o'clock and that after Hamid's uh, presentation, we will have more time for discussion. But now for another 18 minutes, I think we should continue this date on thing because Hamid's uh, story will, 
build upon it in the way that he will address the possibilities for society and from society to address some of the very important issue of concern of citizens and whom and how do we address. And, and I think this, uh, in a very indirect way, uh, shows uh, limitations certainly of citizenry in Bosnia and Herzegovina to find the channels to address any of these very important societal issues. Uh, so, continuing from uh, these two answers, uh, I would give a floor to Holly, Adam, and Fahredin, who already posed the questions on our chat. So, Holly, please go ahead. Well, I actually think you just answered my question because I was just okay. going to ask that okay. although your constitutional model sounds wonderful, um, how can they actually get out of the stalemate that they're in now and whether that's too late? But then you just said, either reform or collapse. So do you just think, like, do people in Bosnia see this as a big an issue in the, in the same way that you do, in the sense that things will just come to a head between the three groups? Or where will the tension be that will cause the, the collapse? Valerie, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, see, I see it as a longer term process of um, simple depopulation. Uh, since December, I've been doing two different research projects where I've been visiting about 15 different communities. And, and last week I was on the road in Bosnia and everybody uh, I'm speaking to will note that uh, corruption and the economy and education are the biggest problems and that they have little to no hope that anything can fix this. Um, and so they're voting with their feet by leaving, basically. Um, there, there's a strong sense and there's a strong awareness um, that politicians are not thinking about um, the people, about the citizens. Um, the COVID crisis Revealed, and everybody knew from the beginning that it was going to be used as a platform for more corruption. And there have been several cases where we've seen laid bare the total patronage and the thievery, basically, among the political parties and actors, and then how they basically count on the fact that the justice system doesn't work to get away with it. Um, and, and so people have simply lost hope in this. Um, and what's even more depressing is the number of people who feel that there's that the international actors, whether that would be the United States or the EU or other country, Western countries, either don't understand and are completely stupid to understand to not understand the actual problems here, um, or that we're complicit in it. There is a lot of people who really believe that the um, that the poor policy choices made and that the partnerships with the elites in the region are because there's some broader game at play. Um, there was a lot of criticism. For example, after the recent Serbia elections, when we saw European actors congratulating Vucic for winning in a democratic race, when everybody in Serbia knew that it wasn't a really free, fair, democratic election. And, and so all of these dynamics are undermining, um, undermining the, the long the number one um, human asset stripping, which is already underway. And then we're going to start seeing a final um, feeding frenzy to sort of basically try to um, steal what hasn't been stolen. And what worries me then is that there will be some further territorial agendas that will be pursued in some ways that will not be able to be done peacefully. Arif? The only thing I'll add is, um, so as I mentioned, there are two pathways, reform and collapse. Within the reform pathway, there is the, the suggestion that was made of having this incremental, progressive, natural development. That is not a pathway for Bosnia. So the only other pa reform pathway is formal amendment to the constitution. Now you need to incentivize everybody to come on board for that. You need to in incentivize all the major elites to do that. And I, I set this out in a forthcoming book, I can plug that now. <laughs> um, but essentially that there are a number of steps you can take, and that's where I use game theory incentive structures to how do you get the major elites which, are, which really love the current system, how do you persuade them to take some decisions that are in their long-term interest in 10 years time today? And it's a, it's a topic in itself, but there are ways and methods to do that. Um, I agree with, with, with Valerie about um, brain drain being a serious problem. 
the other aspect to that is, of course, there are foreign powers with serious agendas in the region itself, um, and they have intervened in the past. Um, and those foreign powers, at an opportune moment, could take advantage of the vacuum of power in, in, in Bosnia, or they can support specific agendas against others for their own interests. And I think that is sadly the most likely outcome. And we've seen foreign intervention in other countries in the region. We had a few years ago, I think, um, attempted coup by Russian agents in Montenegro. So it's not that far-fetched to say there, will, there are um, very serious, powerful interests to see that would very much welcome a broken up Bosnia. And sadly, that's not something that can be ruled out or being seen as far-fetched. Uh, thank you so much. So, Adam and then uh, Fahruddin. Hello. Yeah, thank you for the uh, thank you for your talks. Um, just a very quick question to Aris. Just so, um, how are you going to ensure with these referenda that are sort of gradually come about will be mutually drafted? I think this is um, mainly in considering the twelve percent minority who are likely to sort of be excluded as they currently are. Um, in that initial stage? So, so there are many um, um, templates, so to speak, that you can draw upon. Um, for instance, South Africa had a three-year co consultation process for its constitution. Um, there was an interim constitution that was drafted. It had ratchet rights so that it made itself obsolete in three years' time. It brought in all the different actors um, in South Africa, including pre-apartheid actors. So people who'd committed crimes were even brought in to assist and support the interim constitution because they recognized that without having even people who violated others' rights in a very serious sense in that process as powerful figures, whether that's state security or the military, that you wouldn't get an inclusive outcome through the cons consultation process. So firstly, you need a very broad very well um, advertised, a very well distributed uh, contribution process to drafting a constitution. You need a convention that set out some framework and ground rules about how that consultation will happen. Um, and then there are ways of creating question setting, agenda setting, how you can get ensure that any, any framing of any question goes through a process which ensures that there isn't a bipartisan angle to it. Um, there's a whole debate about how you frame a question without it. Obviously, we know as lawyers, it's not having leading questions, but there are also ways of framing things. Um, there's some very interesting books by um, Carl Sunstein and Thaler about um, uh, the nudge theory of questioning, how you get outcomes by framing things in a particular manner. So as an example, if you ask somebody, do you want to donate your organs um, when you die to go for medical causes, 99% of people will say, yeah, of course, if it's going for medical causes, nobody will actually sign a paper doing it. If, however, you opt people in to um, uh, organ donations once you've died, um, basically, so you, the 99% will be secured because the 1% one, the 1 who don't want it will actually write in to say we don't want it. So essentially the preferences of people, the 99% will accord with the outcome if you opt them in and have an opt out. However, if you have an opt in, as in one that you're asking people to do it, 99% they want to do it, but they won't. So, so you need to think about how people behave in particular settings. So you can have nudge aspects to this and you need to, you need to remove probably some aspects of nudge. And you also need to remove some aspects of bias uh, in questioning in order to ensure outcomes aren't partisan by default. And you'll probably get agreement on that because nobody wants an unfair process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fakhredin. I don't know whether you heard me or not. I do hear you. I Good. hope Thank the rest you. can hear as well. Everyone. As I wrote already, my question to Valerie was, what was the weakness side of the Dayton Agreement? Actually, 25 years uh, from now, uh, after the war is ended, ceasefire, according to the Dayton Agreement, 
to my perspective, I still see the BHA that's a fragile. I don't know whether uh, this agreement has a, the, also the weakness side or not. How is opinion of Valerie on this issue? I, I think Dayton only is showing weaknesses right now. Um, Dayton served a purpose for about two or three years right after the war, um, but it was not a, a solid foundation at all for building a state. Um, I think at its core, the, the notion of having uh, the notion of having three peoples in two entities and having this other group of citizens or others that are systematically discriminated against um, just demonstrates the fact that this was an effort that was aimed at being good enough um, and nothing better. Um, we have to realize that when they, when the negotiators were at Dayton, the number one interest by Holbrook and the others were getting basically the representatives of the three warring parties to sign. It wasn't accountability. It wasn't to prevent party control. It wasn't to ensure that um, national minorities or people from mixed marriages had rights. It was to make sure that you had uh, Serbia and Croatia and uh, Bosnia signing, and that was it. Um, and so it was, um, it was a suitable end to the war, but it was never appropriate for uh, building a functional country. And the only thing to add to that is um, Croatia and Serbia were guarantors to the peace agreement. They signed and were willing to approve and sign as guarantors to annexes to the constitution, uh, to, to annexes to the peace agreement, but they were unwilling to sign um, a, as a guarantor to the constitution itself. Um, and remember that the constitution has a provision that allows entities to maintain separate foreign relations with third states. And that is something that has really compromised the unity of the Bosnian state because Republic of Serbia can go and send its own diplomats to all sorts of countries to serve its own interests and vice versa. And so, you know, where you have entity within a state allowing to conduct itself for essentially foreign relations, even though that's precluded, you know, you, you severely undermine the authority and power of the centralized state. Um, and if, if Croatia and Serbia were neutral actors, that would be fine, but of course they're not. And so that also is an aspect that we have to consider. Nana, if there are no more questions, I think it'd be helpful to have your commentary on this because you're very knowledgeable about uh, all of these aspects from uh, your own particular position. Can't hear you, Nana. You're, you're muted. Unmute. Uh, one of the things that I would like uh, Valerie and, uh, and Arif to engage in uh, maybe a small debate is the fact that Valerie said that uh, she finished, I think, uh, uh, her uh, presentation with a sentence, uh, it's something in the it, it, Dayton agreement, Dayton constitution is some sort of dead end. Which word did you use? Dead end. Evolutionary dead end. The evolution, and I think this is uh, this evolutionary I missed, and I think it's absolutely amazing and well uh, done. While uh, Arif said and set up the uh, possibilities of reform for which he actually wants to animate the ruling classes. And if I put these two positions, I find you two being completely on a different side of the future. Although in your discussion, you all the time agreed with each other. So I want to see why did you agree so much while you are so completely opposite when it comes to the future date. Valerie? Um, yeah, no, I have to be honest. I don't see any situation in which the current ruling elites could possibly change a system that benefits them so well. Uh, they have no incentive to do so. And we wouldn't expect that in any uh, country um, to sort of weaken their own powers and their own benefits. Um, I think I'm not saying that you shouldn't be involved in politics, um, but any sort of effort to actually have a different discussion about what the constitution can look like needs to basically exploit 
the transactionalism that is inherent in a party democracy and try to play on the egos of other political actors. So for example, I, I am supportive of a different constitutional model three, which is referred to as municipalization, where basically you would have municipal governance, a state government, and you would not have the entities and the canons because that's where the ethno-nationalism and corruption lie. Um, one way to try to move toward the system would be to demonstrate to the mayors of the country how the current system actually pre prevents them from doing everything they should be doing to try to enrich and improve their municipality. Um, when you go and talk to uh, municipalities and to mayors in the Republic of Srpska, unless they're one of the larger uh, municipalities that's benefiting from the largesse of Banja Luka, it, there's a lot of dissatisfaction. In Han Piesek, for example, they get to keep fewer than 5% of the amount of money coming from forestry exploitation, for example. And, and you see this time and time again. So, so in theory, one should be able to engage with mayors to get them to recognize that they would personally and locally do better if they dissociate themselves from some of the ladies that want to, um, similarly, trying to engage with citizens who are unhappy with the situation can create more of a bottom-up effort that can then can translate into change down the road. But I can't imagine a scenario ever where SDA, HDZ, SNSD, or SDS will ever seek to uh, fundamentally change uh, the Constitution unless it's in a way that is further division and further ghettoization based on the notion of constituent peoples. Good. Thank you, Valerie. So I have a tricky one for you. So somehow you do understand that we do not see any, any uh, prospect and perspective in all these pages in your book where you show us all models for, um, for reform or constitution. It would be almost like you would write a book and offer the reform possibilities for North Korea. This is the first <laughs> analogy I have. So I said, please tell us, we are really interested to know but uh, what is the reality touch in, in all these pages that you have written about different models of reform of Dayton constitution? Firstly, I very much welcome the criticism. Uh, well, I haven't <laughs> um, read it yet, so I'm just... <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I accept the major premise. But Valerie said the current political elites have no incentive to current to change the current structure, which then begs the question, how do you change the current structure? You don't, you don't have an evolutionary pathway, you don't have a formal amendment pathway, and therefore you have only seemingly collapsed, it's a matter of time. And I refuse to accept that that is the only pathway collapse, because that will be devastating given also the history and the conflict in, in the re region previously. So that's my starting point. Second, just, just a call on. So you you understood that it's either reform or collapse, which you thought it would be war and nothing in between. So you well, there may not be see nothing in between. There may be something in between, mm -hmm. I guess. Okay, I just to make on. sure that I understand. Okay. Uh, so it's second, twelve o'clock, Arif. So yes. your last the, sentence, the, and then Valerie, uh, uh, Carol, we will deal with your question a little bit later, if you the, don't mind. My my second premise is, and that's the premise of this book, is that the people do not, generally speaking, when assessed formally, have the same views as their elites. Now, if that's true, we need to think of ways to bring popular participation into the process and that the popular preferences align with the elites that represent them. And in order to do that, you need to bring in the elites in the same way you would post-war in South Africa and other places. You need to create incentives for the elites. What will an elite need to do, need to be assured of about their position, their pay, all sorts of other factors, to, to say to them, look, actually in 10 years time, you can be in this new structure, which in reality you believe in, or you would be welcome to be part of and have your preferences aligned with your own people, because that will benefit you in the long term and you can keep your money and your position, etc. And that is the basis of the book. How do you how do you play on those incentives? How do you play on those incentives and preferences? We should remember, as a just a final point, that Milorad Dodik, the leader of Republika Srpska, at the outset of his career, he was a darling liberal. 
You know, he was lauded by all the Western powers. He was taught by somebody I was taught by in Sarajevo, a professor of law from Serbia, who's again, an expert on Greek law, completely liberal. And, and you know, he had taught him and he was a liberal student as well as a liberal initial practitioner. The question is, why did he change track? Why did he, why was he incentivized to be a nationalist in that system? And that's because it made perfect sense. If you're in that system and you want to stay in power, you need to be nationalistic. The question is, how do you change and calibrate those factors? And that's what the book is primarily concerned with. It's not concerned with okay, having this Arif, model or I, that model. I need now really logically to ask you something. So think about mafia structures in Italy and America. And you say we have to get rid of mafia and we have to include them in a, in a, a white economy mafia state. <laughs> Thank you. And we have to incorporate them in all economic, social, political processes, but we need to give them incentive. So let them keep all their privileges in a way, gaining money. You don't achieve anything because you're giving incentives of the people. Do you think that any of them need money as incentive? They have so I, much money. They print money, not a bene. <laughs> you know, they can print any a, money they want. But I, I don't, and in 25 years, uh, why there was no, incentive possible whatsoever that we even can see the change for better uh, I, I, because it's inter if it was not pos possible in 25 years why and should anyone who made so many mistakes be given another 25 years for another chance to legitimize himself or herself of a political party. I mean, that, that, that's an extremely problematic notion. Well, let uh, me and give it's a, a, a political notion because every party has to uh, uh, go to elections and in political process it's a co completely different power uh, game than what you are saying. You are almost wanting to administrate the, the state uh, institutions and rule and I'm not quite sure how it would ever turn out into anything better than what we have now. Let uh, me just give a, end with a very different analogy. Yeah, last, okay. How did you end slavery in the UK? You didn't end slavery by getting all the slave owners to hold hands and say, let's end slavery because it's morally and ethically the right thing to do. The British state paid slave owners to buy their slaves and free them. And we were still paying in 2015 as taxpayers for the debt of billions of pounds that it cost to pay the slave owners. And it was a combination of moral, ethical campaigning and advocacy combined with practical mechanism, which was the payment of very already quite wealthy people, additional money in order to encourage them practically to give up slavery. And I, I use that example because it, sh it just goes to show that you have sadly tensions in how you practically achieve these outcomes. And I think in the same way that you will have uh, people you dislike in the institutional structures of Bosnia, you have to acknowledge that they have power and influence. And what incentive structure do you create an environment for them to give up a little bit of power now in the hope of getting something in return? And a number of combinations, I set up, I think 11 steps almost, to, to say how would you get an actor to essentially go, get, go against their own interest immediately. And that's a combination of nudge, behavioral economics and game theory, and also pressure, external pressure from foreign states, um, and also consequences for commis commission of crime. So it's slightly different than having a mafia type analogy because crimes are beyond the pale. And if, if you've committed war crimes and there are plenty, plenty of people still in Bosnia not being prosecuted for them, that I'm not talking a... about war crimes, I'm talking about some particular parties that absolutely do engage in mafia-like politics and one particular party that uh, is actually, you could uh, qualify it as the biggest uh, uh, job agency in Bosnia because it has a function to provide jobs to everyone who joins them and votes, uh, votes for them. So this, the, the levels of corruption are so deep and part of the economy that I do not 
frankly, see any politician who would read, not your instructions, but anyone's instructions say, Jesus, why didn't you tell us before? No, they will find a new way to obstruct the system and to find the privilege to, to continue and retain the uh, privilege based systems that have nothing to do with uh, thinking of a brighter future of politics. So maybe I am too much of a uh, native <laughs> for this sort of analysis, but I, I, we, will dis, uh, we will continue do this discussion and Arif, I really certainly don't want my work to be now the, the last one. So Valerie and Arif, the last comment on this and we will move to, to Hamid. Sure. No, I think, um, I think the fact that Arif and I agree on all of the main conceptual issues and just are trying to sort of game out how to fix it, it is good because again, the underlying and recognition um, possible that we might be seeing is an opportunity for a new option because the dynamics of corruption have become so transactional that it's only transactionalism that's really feeding the large um, uh, the, the, the elites and the parties. And it's not even a veneer of ideological belief really at this point. Um, and the interests are, individual interests are starting to trump some of the party interests. And so trying to peel away people who are getting disillusioned with the system uh, could have some uh, impact. Thank you. Arif, yours is the last word before we move to I that. just endorse Valerie's view. <laughs> so the, I, mean, I can't believe it. You say you agree and in the same time you disagree all the time. I like this. So you, I understand. <laughs> I understand the dynamics. It works well for educational purposes.